Uh, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Roberto Rocco. I'm an, an associate professor in spatial planning and strategy at TU Delft, and I study governance and regional planning. And uh, I am interested in theory of justice applied to, to planning. Thank you so much for inviting me. I was given very generously quite a, a, a long time to develop my, my story, uh, 40 minutes. So we are close to lunchtime. Yeah. So I really hope uh, I can keep you entertained. Um, and I will ask you to please uh, interrupt me and uh, ask questions in the, in the chat. So without further ado, let me try to share my screen and my presentation. <clears throat> no, uh, just a second. I have three, I have, I have three screens, so it's a kind of a complicated. Oh. Okay, I think you can see it. Yes, Thank perfect. The, the... All right, so um, I was invited to talk about visioning and to give you practical advice on how to, to make a vision. And uh, at first I was a, li a little bit surprised because I think that Delta Metropole is the big vision maker <laughs> and they know more about vision making than anyone. But uh, I'll try to, to say something uh, relevant, to be honest. And uh, based on my experience as a teacher um, at TU Delft, and uh, uh, for some, I'm sure after it, it's a very tough, uh, tough job to follow. Jeran and Merton, uh, uh, some of what I'm going to say is uh, pretty basic, but I think we need to talk about this basic idea. So I'm going to talk about visioning, and I'm going to start by uh, by telling you a little bit how. I developed my idea about visioning. I come from this crazy, crazy city called Sao Paulo in Brazil. It's one of the most exciting, amazing cities in the world, I would say. It has 11 million people in, in, in its, um, in its uh, municipality, but 20, 22 million in the metropolitan region. And it's a cacophony of buildings and periods and architecture and public spaces that are really uh, uh, vivid. But it is, I dare say, a, a city without a vision. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of direction. And lots of this city, many, many parts of, of this city are, uh, are uh, we would call them informally conceived, right? Really grassroots, bottom up, built by people who don't have access to all the rights that they should have, right? So they, we have uh, quite a few neighborhoods that look like this. They are unplanned and so on. So I, while I was growing up, I think I had this, uh, and, and uh, I want, to, I want to also introduce, well, I went to this university, to the University of Sao Paulo, which is an amazing place as well, full of ideas and full of energy and beautiful, beautiful buildings. So I was inspired by this and inspired by all the amazing architecture that uh, I had around me, all these masters who had designed the super iconic buildings and uh, which I, I really truly loved. And I think I had this will to reform the city. I wanted to, you know, I was, uh, I can picture myself on a bus trying to redesign the city constantly and trying to think, okay, how can I make this better? How this would be better? And, and uh, I'm, I'm sure I am exactly like you. You also must have had this experience that uh, I want to do this better. And uh, without realizing, I think I, I had a little bit of this politician's attitude towards the city. 
which is I could only think about uh, projects. I thought about designs and I thought about how can I make this place better with a better design. And of course, uh, this is very useful and very important. Design is central. However, uh, I think uh, it's a little bit of a problem when we start to think the city in terms of projects only and trying to reform the city using projects, right? There are many pros uh, to this approach. Uh, the pros are related to concrete immediate action that tell voters someone is doing something. So that's how politicians approach it, Approach it, right? Uh, well, I need to show my voters I am doing something and a project is, is best. Uh, immediate or short-term results that fit with electoral and budget frameworks, for example. So we, we have four-year uh, 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 election um, cycles and we have budget cycles and so on that we have to, to abide to. <clears throat> and we can see immediate improvement in the built environment, which many people really like. Why not? But there are some cons to this way of thinking. One is that uh, it's generally related to a very top-down form of governance that doesn't include diverse voices. So I think uh, for me, that's already something that I uh, starts me thinking. Uh, there are lots and lots of pet projects and vanity projects that do not address uh, real needs. And um, they, these projects that politicians, mainly in the global south, I have to say, that's not such a big problem in the Netherlands, but uh, many of these projects are disconnected from broader strategies that could amplify the effects of these same projects, right? Uh, so if, um, uh, that's that's the main thing I see is that uh, many politicians they they think about things but they forget to look at the bigger picture and how uh, inserting projects in a strategy would amplify the effects of the project. And finally, I think uh, we often disregard the city as a complex system, um, a multi-stakeholder multi environment where. The, the will and the genius of the architect is not the most important thing. Um, of course, uh, maybe pet projects and, um, and uh, you know, pet projects, they're not bad in themselves. Some, some of them are quite interesting, albeit disconnected from a, from a bigger, uh, from a bigger picture. And I always remember this uh, garden bridge uh, uh, that was proposed in London and that was not, uh, never realized and has recently, I think a few years ago, people said, no, we're not going to invest so much money in the garden bridge. It's not, uh, but in itself, maybe it's, a, I don't know, maybe as a public space, it would be fantastic if we had it. But if we start to understand the city from the point of view of the three dimensions of sustainability, which we all do, I'm sure, and to look at it from a social, environmental, and economic perspective, then things start to get a little bit more complex and complicated. And of course, uh, we uh, this is the same triangle as, as mostly used in the Netherlands, people, planet, and prosperity. I, I don't use the word uh, profit because I think profit is not uh, inclusive and prosperity is more inclusive. Uh, you, mi you, mi you might uh, disagree with me and say, well, there's nothing wrong with profit. It's, it's fine. But this uh, triangle of sustainability, I would say, is also related to how uh, we must understand our task and the city as a multi-stakeholder environment in which the government is just one uh, actor, but we need to involve the private sector and the civic society as robustly as we can. I think Merton um, uh, made reference to that, uh, to that when he said, well, we need to understand how, how these, uh, co these logistics companies work in order to be able to plan for them uh, and in order for us to have a circular economy. 
The same goes for for Jaran's uh, talk when um, when she says, "Well, we need to understand the needs of uh, people who are very different from us, and and include them in the way that we 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 think about a design." So, okay, I think, um, and please feel free to to disagree, that we need visions, but we don't need any vision. We need visions that are able to shape the attention of stakeholders. If I go back to my uh, governance um, triangle, then I, I can say that uh, this is an oversimplification of how governance works. And we actually have clouds of, of stakeholders, right? Clouds of actors um, in which uh, we are trying to get some balance, which is impossible, but anyway, we are always trying to, okay, how can civil society actually put checks and balances on the private sector? How can it put checks and balances on the public sector and vice versa? And in that way, we can uh, arrive at some kind of, uh, well, public agreement, actually. So one of the things that we are, we are going to do with our visions is to shape the attention of these clouds of stakeholders. You can't tell them what to do exactly, but you can show the way. You can inspire, you can give ideas, and you can um, tell them, well, why don't we look towards that direction? Why don't we look towards the circular economy, for example? And then um, in the hopes that these clouds of stakeholders will start to respond to the vision, right? Because um, in a democratic state um, uh, and democracy has many, many flaws, but it's the best uh, system of government we have so far, I believe. Uh, you can't make people do things. You can with regulation and laws, et, et cetera. But uh, in order to control this huge network of people, it's better if you um, make them look in the same direction or uh, make them look in, uh, towards the same idea. So, okay. Um, a vision might, if well conceived, uh, give direction and meaning to diverse interests that many times are conflicting, but some, sometimes they can uh, go uh, towards the same direction. Um, it allows for more rational choice of alternative, alternatives and budget planning, especially if the vision is um, uh, uh, evidence-based. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. And uh, it allows us for a longer time frame uh, for, for adjustment. So the vision doesn't have to be, um, it's, it's not a project, it's a vision. So it can be adjusted and it can sh change shapes, uh, et cetera. For me, a vision is a shared exercise in which diverse voices are heard and given attention to, which means that we ideally, and I'm sure, you all agree with me, it's very difficult to do this in um, university setting or even in this workshop. I don't know how much we, we are, we can interact with, with the stakeholders, but it, it would be ideal to have co-design. And it would be ideal if we could um, base our, uh, our uh, visions on evidence and science and knowledge. And I say that, um, and I think you will, uh, I'm going to show that a little bit later in my, in my presentation. Uh, it's all very well to have very speculative visions that are kind of crazy and that are completely, you know, unbound with, uh, with, with anything, with money, with anything. But I think that it's actually more uh, challenging and more interesting and more, uh, yeah, exciting to do visions that are anchored on real evidence, and that uh, uh, is uh, and is responding to real needs and real challenges. Most of all, um, a vision is a narrative about a possible and desirable future, and of course, it's up to you guys to come up with things that nobody has thought about. Right, uh, I think the innovation is there, 
uh, to, to really be creative. But that brings me to another question is that uh, I think visions should be most of all values based and maybe one, uh, so maybe I'm babbling here a lot, but uh, maybe a, a good way to start the vision is to map the values of the stakeholders you are working with. And mapping values is possible via interviews, via participatory uh, workshops, via looking at the websites of companies, for example, but you need to, to, to map these values. Of course, you have your values and I'm not saying that you shouldn't use them. You should, everybody has values and no design is value-free or neutral. Those who say that I think are misguided. I think we need to make our values explicit when we are uh, designing, but we need to understand the values of other people um, who are different from us. And at the same time, uh, anchor our, our vision on real challenges and real knowledge about these challenges and not so much uh, so that's a, that's a little bit of the problem with uh, pet projects and uh, you know uh, vanity projects. Is many times they're not uh, based on evidence. Of course, um, visions should be based on text and image. And I saw a very interesting um, uh, comment from Paul in the chat saying, "Well." Also numbers, right? Uh, that's what I mean by evidence-based. So we have a narrative and a narrative, I, I think it's, it's very difficult to think of a narrative that is only visual. I think even when we have um, the visual part is very important, we always have a story behind it and, uh, and, um, and spatial modeling. So I think, I think visions can be made through modeling space and through understanding how space works, obviously. I'm sure this is so very basic to you guys, but anyway, I, I, I felt I had to say that. Um, we are going to talk about this strategy a little bit, uh, this vision a little bit uh, later, but uh, this is a, a, a very nice example of, of a narrative that is connected to a little drawing and then people can understand everything, uh, uh, can understand actually the narrative through, through visual aids. And I think that's quite valuable. That's very important. Most of all, uh, and that's maybe my contribution here today is that I think a vision should be an exercise in public reasoning and public justification. And what does that mean? It means that in the multi-stakeholder uh, environments in which we live and in democracies, we need to have public discussions about how the city should be um, designed and planned. And uh, these public discussions should lead to some sorts of agreements and to some sort of public justification, which, which means that you know, the policy is justified, the money is justified, the uh, actions are justified and make sense in a political project. Vision making is an opportunity for democracy building, I think, and it's deeply, deeply connected to the idea of the right to the city from Henri Lefebvre and later developed by many people, uh, uh, including David Harvey, for example, for whom the right to the city is the right to shape your own um, living environment. So I think uh, the vision should, should uh, cater for that, should cater for people's rights to the city, for their right to shape their own environment. We don't have time today, uh, but uh, I invite you, um, of course, my presentation will be available. You can have a look at these authors who are discussing these issues I have been mentioning in depth. Eleanor Ostrom with the idea of polycentric governance, for example, and how we solve the problem of the commons. Uh, Patsy Healy and Judith Eames uh, with the idea of communicative planning. And John Forrester also uh, along those lines, 
how communication, public justification, and public um, public reasoning leads to good projects and to good cities. And finally, the great Amartya Sen, um, who talks about uh, democracy as a government by discussion. And I think this democracy building project uh, that uh, Amartya Sen tells us about has a lot to do with vision making. I don't know about you guys, but I'm so worried about what's going on in the world uh, right now about democracy and uh, how people are catering for populists. And uh, so we desperately need new narratives and new visions. I do have friends who are very right wing. Uh, yeah, that so sounds even a little bit strange to say I have friends who are right wing, but I ask them, what is your vision for, 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 for the future? And they are a little bit unable to give that. So this extreme right wing people, they, they have a very simplistic view of, of uh, reality. And I think it's our job to put, um, to put visions um, out there. And Amartya Sen is talking exactly about that. I don't have to tell you it needs to be concise and inspiring. It should be a little bit generic actually, because we want a broad church of, of interests to be included. If you are too detailed, maybe people will start voicing their, their you, you know, uh, you will have too much opposition. It's in the, the devil is in the details, obviously. So the devil is in the project, but um, maybe the vision doesn't have to be so very uh, precise. Let's agree on the big ideas first, then we can agree on the, on the, on how to achieve them. But it must be specific enough that allows for a strategy to be designed. And by strategy, obviously I mean spatial interventions, I mean non-spatial actions, and I mean policies. All these things are part of a strategy. Uh, what are the cons of this? Too much poll dating. So if, for those of you who don't know this um, expression, it comes from this uh, Dutch, um, a cultural characteristic, which is to uh, uh, seek, uh, seek um, consensus uh, uh, all the time, and it might lead to a lot of time cons consumption, right? Uh, 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 Poder means we have to decide how the next powder is going to be built, and it sometimes takes a long time to decide things together. Too long of a time frame for political ambitions and the problem of many hands. So you have a problem of accountability. Who is responsible in the end for the vision? Now, my, my uh, and often uh, visions are many times too generic and unattainable. That's a problem. So the funny thing is that when I say those things to my students, they immediately go, ah, yes, yeah, so, so, okay. So these are the problems. So it actually doesn't work, right? Um, no, it does work. It's difficult. Um, it's not easy to do, but we, it, 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 I think it does work. Um, so instead of governing by projects, uh, visioning means governing by inter integrated vision making, which leads to strategies, which leads to projects, obviously. Um, which means that we will have an increased performance of coordinated and integrated sp spatial development strategies to achieve sustainable development. Um, it's important to propose a set of integrated cross-sectoral coordinated actions, projects and policies. And when you are conceiving the vision, I think it's a good idea to think about these things. How am I doing in terms of time? Um, Alan Krita, how much time do I have? Um, I think it's a little bit of maximum five, 10 minutes more. Yeah, I, I think I can do it in 10 minutes. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Um, now ha let's have a look. Let's have a look at some um, uh, types of visions or types of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, that have emerged. And of course, everybody knows the city in Italy, Palma Nova. And uh, of course, this has a lot of uh, a symbolic uh, meaning, right? So the Renaissance was this time when man and rationality became to became more important in relation to to, 
to the divine and every and the magical thinking. So rationality became uh, important. Geometry became more important, and uh, this led to the creation of Palmanova, more or less like it was designed. Right? It's kind of a really, it's really a, a successful project. You you may say because it was designed as a project like this, and it is like this. But uh, the role of, of uh, visioning has changed uh, a lot. And I, I, I really like this image of, of New York uh, uh, drawn in 1908 and how kind of impossible actually it is, but maybe maybe not, maybe, maybe I'm prejudiced. Maybe we do have something or will have something similar. Notice, however, that nature is completely absent from this picture. There is no nature, it's only human. And the same from this other uh, 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 image from a little bit later, there is no nature, only technology, right? So technology is going to solve all our problems. We are going to live in these huge buildings. And, uh, you know, even, even here, they are this is not a modernist drawing, obviously, but the, there is a separation of, uh, of functions and, uh, and circulation and so on. But things start to get really seriously with the with uh, serious with the futurist the futurists like Antonio Santelia, the great great uh, Italian futurist um, who designed these incredible incredibly detailed futuristic cities, where again technology is the king. So we don't have humans, but we don't have nature. Uh, and we only have technology almost uh, as the cities, this pure uh, vision of technology. And, uh, and there is a reason for that, right? The futurists, they were a little bit tired of the old things from Italy. They said, oh, you know, this is too much baggage for us. We need to, to think about a new world of the machine. And that's what they did. Well, a little bit later in time, this is another vision uh, that is much more um, related to what we learned. Uh, uh, you know, this is a typical kind of fut uh, modernist understanding with separation of uh, circulation, big uh, 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 green spaces that are kind of empty, um, you know, helicopters and so on. So that's quite uh, interesting. But nature is already there, right? Nature is kind of important here. There are open spaces, sun, and the health. I think that uh, health is a, an important thing here. Um, I love this uh, this uh, futuristic Netherlands. So this <laughs> dike, and uh, funnily enough, I think this has kind of become a, it's becoming a little bit uh, true through this construction of uh, parking parking garages serving as dick, dikes and so on. So I think this is super, super interesting in how this is already quite integrated with nature, I would say, compared. Um, we have lots of things in, 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 uh, in storytelling, in, in fiction, right? So um, maybe you know this Akira, this is a, 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 a comic from, the, uh, from Japan. And they imagine this um, futuristic Tokyo af after a, 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 an atomic bomb uh, and the reconstruction of new Tokyo. And that's how they imagined it also without nature, um, uh, but uh, also with this uh, huge uh, social gaps um, in, in, the, in the manga. This is how they imagine the city in Blade Runner. Also Blade Runner is famously a film about the absence of nature, right? Uh, everything is mechanic. Uh, only humans are, are biological. <clears throat> and I think uh, uh, this uh, blind faith in technology is gonna save us uh, is really well reflected in this movie, Elysium, uh, in which the rich of the earth have all migrated to this space station where they live in a super green, super nice, uh, um, a atmosphere while on earth. This is the vision of Los Angeles, right? A, a really impoverished uh, a place. Um, this is, they actually copied this idea from before. Uh, a lot of people have been imagining how a space station would look like. 
uh, and how we would look uh, live in space. I think it's a little bit like, uh, okay, we cannot take care of our planet. Why do we want to go to Mars? But anyway, um, uh, talking about evidence-based and scientific thought and rationality and trying to, to understand space and trying to understand how can I expand the city of Barcelona uh, beyond its uh, walls and connect all the little uh, 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 communities around Barcelona in a logical, rational, but also beautiful way. And uh, here uh, is what we get, right? Uh, if, you, if you don't know, please uh, look at the book, uh, The Rule and the Model by a French uh, professor called Françoise Choet, where she uh, explains uh, the process of, of, uh, of um, designing Barcelona. Um, very old image, everybody knows this. Thanks God it was never built, but uh, of course this is a vision that expresses more of uh, philosophy and the need for uh, air and health and so on. But it did have lots and lots of consequences for how we built our, our cities and our communities. Uh, also in the Netherlands quite a lot. The Netherlands has a very humanized, I think, kind of modernism. Um, Motopia, this uh, utopia of the car, uh, well, the car is, uh, uh, cars are on top of the buildings, so you can free the space uh, below for people to walk. So actually they say it's a pedestrian paradise, uh, also quite integrated with nature. I think that's very interesting and how then people would be living, you know, be, uh, uh, beneath the cars. This image of Paris is a little bit uh, complicated for me because I think it's so much of greenwashing. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about this, <laughs> this kind of vision because it's a lot of greenwashing. Like, okay, let's make everything green and then all, all our problems are solved. But uh, we are uh, witnessing right now a kind of a, a, of um, a, a, yeah I'm looking at the at the at the chat uh, we have uh, we are witnessing a huge movement towards uh, the smart city and the green city but we really need to look at the, the foundations the value foundations and also the economic foundations of, for example, building a green city in the desert, which is, they say it's a most, uh, this is Masdar city. So this is supposed to be very sustainable, but it's built in the middle of the desert. So I don't know, I'm a bit concerned about this and these very beautiful images of, so David Zipper says, will the smart cities industry ever stop featuring pics of futuristic streets without actual human beings? So can we go on uh, thinking about cities that don't really incorporate all the variety of stakeholders and social classes and different kinds of people that we have um, or not? Well, I love this vision of a 15 minute Paris city. It's not a smart city. It's such a relatable uh, uh, vision for the city in which you have activities uh, always, uh, you know, you can do everything in 15 minutes and you can uh, reach everything in 15 minutes by bike or by foot. And that would be the ideal city to live in. I invite you, uh, we don't have time to discuss it, but I invite you to look at the uh, vision for the city of Paris, intelligent and um, durable or sustainable, uh, uh, and to look at how they understood uh, the representation of, the, of, the, of this uh, vision, uh, the vision, uh, the, the, the city that is connected, open and sustainable, and how these uh, values or, or low, I don't know, they are then uh, uh, explored in detail. So uh, each of these concepts is then explored in detail and, uh, and explained and can be measured. So being able to measure something is very important. Well, I have a lot of uh, other visions here uh, towards the Randstad, but I'm actually quite, a, a, quite a, a, a 
because uh, you guys from uh, from um, from Delta Metropole are the specialists, so I'm I'm a bit afraid I will say something stupid. So maybe I should just um, stop here and invite uh, you to look at my presentation later and look at the different visions for 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 the Randstad that have emerged and have died and some have survived. Uh, what's a structural vision? I think it's important. Um, and several examples that are in my presentation. But for now, thank you so much. And I hope there are questions. <laughs>